Uh, I'm very delighted today to be um, hosting His Excellency the President Mohammed Bouzoum here at Chatham House. He's told me he has been to the United Kingdom before in 2014, and he's the second President of Niger who has spoken at Chatham House. His predecessor, Mamadou Issoufou, spoke here in 2012, who was the first Nigerian head of state to, 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 to come to this institute. And at that time, he discussed the transition from the constitutional crisis of 2009 to 10. Uh, and he talked also about the regional security situation and his dream for a growing bilateral relationship. Including, he challenged the United Kingdom to open an embassy in Niamey. Well, it uh, took a few more years, but there is an embassy in Niamey, so that's a good thing. Uh, this meeting uh, is on the vision for Niger's development and evolving regional role. Um, it's been filmed, so the meeting is on the record. And uh, Your Excellency, uh, I'm sorry that we're not in a bigger meeting room today, but uh, because of the COVID restrictions, this is what we could provide uh, uh, on this occasion. But we're hoping you come back uh, to Chatham House uh, when you're here for COP26 and then we will be able to welcome you in our big hall downstairs. So as you know, the president uh, has been elected uh, head of state since April 2021. He has served as the Minister of Interior from 2016 to 2020, as well as Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1995 to 96 and from 2011 to 2015. He helped found the Social Democratic Party in 1991 alongside the former president, Isufu uh, Mamadou. He has an academic background in political philosophy from Sheikh Diop University in Dakar, where he developed a focus on the importance of education and development and trade unionism, hence attending the summit today in the United Kingdom. The president will present a, a, uh, some remarks for about 20 minutes, and then we have hopefully the opportunity to, to, to have a discussion. So thank you very much again, President, for coming to Chatham House. You're most welcome. Welcome back, because you have been here once before. And uh, I invite you to make uh, some remarks. Thank you, Excellency. And do take your, your mask off, too. You're very welcome to do that. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me here today in this prestigious Chatham House Institute. And I am delighted to be talking to you, experts of the Sahel region. And I will be delighted to exchange and discuss with you. So today we'll talk about Niger, 2021. is a year that has a big challenge for the sub-region in terms of security. As you know, we have terrorist groups in the region, in some of our countries, and unfortunately, their actions have impacts all over the Sahel. Niger is at the center of the Sahel region. And today, we will be talking about this. And I'm sure that our discussion will be very interesting. To talk about Niger is to talk about other challenges that we face, linked with two problems that to us are very important. First of all, our education system is in crisis, and we have a problem with demographics. These two things are interlinked, and we have a population increase of 3.9% per year, and we have a fertility uh, rate of seven children per woman on average. So. You can see how difficult it, this is and what the pressures are for our education system. If it was running properly, we wouldn't be finding ourselves in the current situation. 
Of course. This begs the question of governance. And this is very much linked with this last situation I mentioned. The education system in Niger is very much in difficulty. We have just organized exams. What we call the brevet d'études, which is equivalent to uh, the first uh, school high, high school exam board. And we have seen the true failure of our system. Which is why I have decided to reshuffle and shake the foundations of this system through reforms deep reforms which mean which means that we have to rethink the training system of our teachers and of the whole education system we need to rethink and redesign the way we train teachers especially when pri in primary school. These children go through 10 years of schooling and then there is one year of specific training. They often do not master the teaching language, especially in scientific topics, scientific disciplines, we can see that we are bound to fail, just like I have just mentioned. So we have increased the level. And we will send our children to specific training schools. and we will increase the length of the training compared to what has been done so far. We will change the curricula and we will introduce a teaching in the national language from the start and we will have systematic examinations. So this is the bet that we are taking on. In terms of governance, of course, as I have already said, just in terms of education, our system is characterized by massive dropouts between primary and secondary school. So we can see 40% of dropouts in some regions and girls are more concerned than boys. We do not have a high school in each village, of course. So children have to leave the village to then go to a different high school in a different village. These conditions mean that they cannot really follow the studies and they cannot succeed in their studies and examinations. So almost half of them drop out of school. And we can see later on massive dropout rates, which means that even though we have improved statistics in terms of general schooling, later on, we have very few students who carry on studying. And who are the most uh, impacted girls? And what we can see is that when a girl is sent to 
high school when she's 13 or 14, fatally. This year, or the year after, she will be given a way to get married. So we have a very high fertility rate because very young girls are sent to be married. 77% of girls are married before they're 18 and 28% are married before they are 15. This explains the very high rate. And one of the ways in the program that we can try to control this parameter is to try to have systems within schools where they can host girls and take care of them and reassure them and maintain them for a particular duration in education. And if we keep the majority of girls in school and give them the possibility to succeed in exams and to have them move on to high schools or professional vocational schools, this means that they will go through two or three levels of schooling. With this perspective, we will therefore have statistics which are completely different. So that's what I wanted to say about school. As it relates to governance, more generally speaking, unfortunately, even growth still depends on human capital. The human capital that we have in the administration and in all departments, whether they're public departments or private departments, the education system is failing and therefore governance feels the impact of this because the staff skills are very limited. And this includes their capacity and ability to teach good governance, uh, democracy and the rule of law. Despite everything, we have an experience, a democratic experience, which is currently establishing its way. The proof is that for the first time, we are involved in a democratic transition in which a president has been democratically elected. 60 years of our independence, there had never been such a phenomenon. The transfer of power from one person to another in Asia had always been characterized by a certain physical brutality. However, in the past, it has always been very violent. There have been military coup d'etats. And now, with what has just happened, with this democratic transfer of power between the President Mohammed Isafu and myself, we have ensured that there has been a transfer of power in a context of democracy. What does this mean? This means that institutions are being strengthened and I am making the bet to strengthen them further by cultivating good governance and ensuring that there is an adhesion to democratic projects and projects of rule of law, much more than there has been in the past. Finally, I would like to talk about the security situation. In Niger, we do not have organizations made up of Nigerians who have come together, even based around ideas that try to counter misery. We do not have Nigerians who feel that they are Islamist. 
We are a country surrounded by three countries where we have terrorist organizations. We have Boko Haram in the Lake Chad Basin. We've been very affected by that since 2015, and this has led to the displacement of 230,000 people at least. And an equivalent number of refugees who have come from the state of Borno in Nigeria. So, Boko Haram is in Niger, and it is not because this organization has a particular plan in uh, Niger. Boko Haram may recruit Nigerians and use them. But this is never with the objective of building something or claiming any institutions within Niger. You also have two organizations, two terrorist organizations. So we have the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara that has its base in the Menaka region, which is very close to Niger, and also in the Gawa region. And they are recruiting a large number of young people from Niger, from Nigerian communities. And they carry out actions against us along the border. Six or seven kilometers away from the Malian border. There is also Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, in what they call the Muslim Islam support group. And this group has experienced a certain growth along the border between ourselves and Burkina Faso. But the most virulent group is a group that commits the most actions against the Nigerian population. And this is the ISGS, which is the local branch of the Islamic State. And they have a tendency to occupy territories in Niger. But since the administration is present, they therefore carry out actions against the peasant populations in that region. Then we have Libya. Libya does not have any terrorist organizations active on our territory, but they are present, particularly in the south. And we have a large platform of criminal groups that are able to live off cross-border criminality. And this happened before the fall of Gaddafi. And since his fall in particular, we have seen a strengthening of these groups. And the existence of these spaces in a rich country, a country that was first and foremost a victim of what happened in 2011, and then which completely allowed the emergence of other groups. But there is also rivalry between rich countries. And this has led to an influx of significant quantities of weapons in the framework of this rivalry and in the framework of this conflict. And it's the first time that we have seen such a quantity of modern sophisticated arms and weapons that have been poured into these spaces and that are taken up by terrorist groups. Never have rebel organizations had access to such weapons. And this is quite remarkable. The wars that are waged against our states today involve young people 
who do not have an education, who are very poor, but who have very sophisticated weapons. They use machine guns. They do not use uh, collective weapons. such as the MK-80s, but they do have very sophisticated weapons that they are able to transport. And the modus operandi of the ISGS is to have people who can carry these arms and these weapons, and they can exact a lot of damage. They also have rocket, ra la rocket launchers, MPGs, RPG-9s. Never before have rebels had, ha have they had availability, this, this available to them. This has never existed before, not in the national liberation wars. We can go back to the Algerian war. All of the wars that have happened in the 60s, 70s and 80s, even in the National Liberation Wars, never have we seen rebel organizations hold as many weapons as these terrorist groups that are currently established in the Sahel region. And this can be explained by what happened in Libya and the ease at which it is, a, it is possible to obtain such weapons. And these weapons are available at very low cost in the Sahel region. And since Libya is an oil country and a rich country, as it relates to criminalized economy, there are lots of weapons that are arriving and this facilitates displacement. And there are many transnational criminal platforms. And this allows terrorist groups and non-state armed groups, generally speaking, to either send drugs or to intercept them as a way to make money by selling these drugs. And therefore, we have a vast territory in which there are groups that live of the sale of these narcotics. So that is the situation. And this is what we are confronted with in Niger. And we are working against this. There are parts of our territory that are occupied by rebel groups. We do not just have one administration. We don't have any of our town halls that have moved to the borders. We have moved our military post and we have reinvested. But we believe that we can do away with this situation through the experience of our security forces. And we are going to pursue this democratic experience. And we believe that we will overcome all of these obstacles. both political obstacles or security obstacles. So those, that is what I wanted to say as an introduction. I hope that I have not spoken for too long. Thank you very much.